Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is community outreach and echo live distance learning, put out by the Michigan Science Center. And here to tell us all about it is Anna Sterner, the Director of Programs at the Science Center. Anna, welcome to the show. Hi, Don. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we're glad to have you here. Now, before we get into uh, the discussion, uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Ooh, a little bit about me. Well, Don and I know each other because we both work at the Science Center. If you've ever had a chance to visit my Sci, you might know that it's in Midtown Detroit. If you've never had a chance to stop by, come on down and do it. We are open to the public. Um, we are a hands-on science museum, but what I focus on really is outreach. Like Don said, I am the director of programs, but what I really like to say about myself is that I am a science communicator. I started here when I was getting my degree in biology from Wayne State, um, and I really just fell in love with teaching other people science. Originally, I thought that I wanted to be a doctor, but what I really found to be fun the longer I worked here at the Science Center is that I really love teaching science to other people. I like to tell people how they can use science in their day-to-day -day life, um, and one of the best things about my job is that I get to do all of the cool things that you see on YouTube. I get to pick clips off of awesome YouTube channels like this one and other ones, and I get to try them myself. And I get to let kids try them here at the Science Center and with me online. Sounds like a great job, Anna. It now, is the best job in the world, I like to think. Now, why is it important to bring STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, to students in our community? That's a great question. You know, even as we talk about STEM and we say things like science, technology, engineering, and math, those words can be kind of intimidating. What I bring to kids and to families is having positive relationships with science. We want kids to just have fun. It doesn't always have to feel like learning like you do in school. And really bringing it out into the community is a focus of what we do here at the Michigan Science Center, um, especially here in Detroit. Kids are sometimes lacking these real life science experiments um, and science experiences that other kids might have. And so that's really our goal is to bring it out, to have people actually touch it, try it, do it themselves, um, and have someone like us, like you or I, Don, that are able to help them have a positive experience while they're doing it. What made me originally fall in love with doing science was actually just doing it at home with my dad. But when he was young, he used to like to take things apart and put them back together. And that's one of the things that we would do together as I was growing up. It made me realize that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to break stuff. Um, but it gave me a really good understanding of how things work and how science is really a part of everything that you do all the time. It doesn't always have to feel like you're being tested. It doesn't have to feel like you're learning it because you're going to take uh, a quiz later on. You can use it to make yourself smarter and to make your life more fun. Well, I know that we're the Michigan Science Center. We bring science to the state of Michigan. But I know one of our core objectives is to bring science and STEM education to underserved communities like Detroit. Are there specific programs that uh, the Science Center has to do that? We do. So right here in the city, um, we actually launched a program that we call Scopes in the City. And it's a really awesome program, um, especially if you're a space lover, which I'm sure if you're here watching this, that you definitely are. Um, but we have a program called Scopes in the City where we bring our telescope collection out to local library branches. Um, and we let people use the telescopes. We bring hands-on science activities to give people an experience, experience that they probably haven't had before. I know that I had really never used a telescope until I started working here. And lots of kids in the city of Detroit probably haven't either. So the object of these programs is that we can pop up right in the town where you live, right at your local library branch, where you already go for things like learning resources or time to spend on the computer doing research or homework. Um, and while you're there, you can have one of those experiences we're talking about. You can learn what's up in the night sky, you can learn how to use a telescope and some amazing science facts and history behind them. Well, that's true. As a matter of fact, I was out on a number of those uh, scopes in the city outreach events. The awe and wonder that uh, the folks who came to the library that evening, uh, it, it's really quite heartening. You know, it, you're glad to bring that to them and it also gives you a, a warm, fuzzy feeling as well. So uh, hopefully once the uh, 
pandemic is passed, we can, we can get back out with that particular program. Now, besides the scopes in the city, what other types of programs do, do you create and present? One of the best parts about my job is that in addition to doing learning here at the Science Center and even stuff virtually like this, which I think we're going to talk a little bit more about later on, is that we also have our traveling science program. So we'll reach communities that aren't right here um, in our direct area either. So we've actually visited 57 out of 83 Michigan counties with our traveling science program. So we can pack up things like our telescope collection or our kaboomistry program where we light things on fire or our frostology program where we freeze stuff with liquid nitrogen. We can pack it all up in the van and drive it anywhere in the state that kids might be looking for these experiences too. So we've visited schools or libraries or camp programs, all with these fun science experiences that we've talked about. Um, I've gotten to go to Michigan's Upper Peninsula quite a few times to visit the libraries up there. And I know Don and I have gone on lots of programs um, around Metro Detroit and even a few counties a bit farther out. So um, if you're interested in any of these kinds of programs, check out our website. Um, we'd love to visit your school. We'd love to connect with you somehow um, with any of our exciting programs like our presentations, um, we also have a portable planetarium, which we call the Star Lab. Um, we have hands-on workshops. If there's any sort of science experience you're looking for, we've got it and we can bring it to you, whether that's in person or virtually. I know one of the popular ones that we've done a number of times is Family Science Night. Can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. So in a Family Science Night, or what we call a Palooza, is we actually can set up in your school's gym or cafeteria or even in an outdoor space if the weather's okay. Um, and we can bring 10 different hands-on activities. That means that the learners who visit, they can visit all the activity stations at their own pace. Um, that's a big reason that we recruit volunteers. We like to engage with the people in these communities, whether that's parents or corporate volunteers or just people who just love science. Even high school students make great volunteers. And those volunteers are the ones who actually facilitate the learning. So it's often for me that I get to show others how to do what I do, how to take something fun and simple and teach it to a child or a student that's younger than them and wants to learn about it too. So um, 10 hands-on activities will set up there for quite a few hours and learners can just stay all day. Um, they can stop at all the stations, make a few fun things to take home with them too. I know one of the other fun uh, programs that we've done in the past is uh, the uh, Science Week at uh, Cedar Point. Now, hopefully we'll get back to that again once the uh, pandemic is cleared up, but I know that's a great time for the students. They bus in from all over the Midwest, and I know that we have a blast doing that as well. That is so true. I like to say that is my favorite week of the whole year is Physics, Science, and Math Week at Cedar Point. Um, so traveling science doesn't just stay right here in Michigan. Cedar Point is just across the Ohio border down in Sandusky. Um, and so there really is no limit to where we can take our programs. And um, kids are definitely there to ride the roller coasters, but it's awesome that we get to kind of reinforce the learning that those kids are doing while they're there too, by bringing some different hands-on experiments and things like that for them to try. That's for sure. Plus it's a great time for us too. How does informal education, which is what we deliver in museums and science centers, how does that help teachers and students? That's another great question. You know, working at a science center, um, the name really says it right there. So being at a science center or working in the science center world is really about putting you, the learner, at the center of science. It's not about, like we said, teaching to test scores or teaching because these are the kinds of things you'll be tested on in school. Um, we really want to empower you to use science in your day-to-day -day life. If you choose to go on to a science career, that's great. That's exactly what we hope that you'll do. But even if you don't say your interests are in something like art or something like music, science is involved in that too. And so the goal of any informal education center, like a science center or a museum, is really about taking it out of the school environment, making it more accessible to learners, making it so that it's something everyone can try and interact with and really just have fun with. We want to teach you how you can use scientific practices in your everyday life. So doing experiments, right? Tinkering with things, taking them apart, putting them back together, um, designing something new, um, even teaching kids, it's okay to fail. It's okay if you make something and it doesn't work. Um, that doesn't mean that you're not a good scientist or that you could never go into science. 
That's actually what all of the great scientists, astronomers, physicists, um, everyone in science has failed. And so what we're hoping at the very least is that we can inspire kids to just keep trying. If it's fun and it's something you enjoy doing, that's all that matters. Very true. And we get to see the enthusiasm of the kids as they come in for their field trips. So it's always a great time. We're going to take a quick break right now. If you have a question, uh, please send us an email. You can see the email address down at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next is Stephen with Term of the Month. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is BFR versus SLS. There's a relatively new space race, a race to the moon. The SpaceX entry is with their BFR and NASA with SLS. Both of these efforts are happening in the United States. BFR informally stands for Big Falcon Rocket. SLS stands for Space Launch System. It's a little confusing. SpaceX provides part of NASA's commercial space flight operations but it also has their own exploration agenda. Let's talk about BFR first. Development started in 2017 with a general description, some goals, and real work on the new liquid methane liquid oxygen Raptor engines, design, prototyping, and testing. Goals mentioned trip to Mars, trips to the moon, and trips from Earth to anywhere on Earth in 90 minutes, and putting satellites into Earth orbit. Versions would be built for cargo, tanker, and crew. It would be two-stage and totally reusable. The first stage is called BFR, and the second stage is called Starship. Design changes have been rapid and a bit hard to follow, the first carbon composite Starship started construction in 2018 in California. In 2019, this second stage would have six Raptors engines down from seven. By August 2020, the first stage BFR, quote, might have 28 engines, unquote, down from as high as 37 due to the higher thrust engine versions doing well on the test stands. First stage thrust is about twice that of the Apollo era Saturn V first stage. In 2019, the first test vehicle, Starhopper, was used for fueling tests, a tethered one meter hop, and two free flights. One of the free flights was 20 meters, and the other was to 150 meters both landing near the launch point. Some 25 milestone events occurred in 2020 as if there wasn't a pandemic and as if there was a space race. A highlight was a test flight called SN8, launched to 12 and a half kilometers Transitioned with small movable wings to glide mode, flipped back to vertical, and ignited an engine for the descent. The vehicle was destroyed in the end, but it showed that the overall plan should work on Mars or Earth. Now, the moon doesn't have air for wings but the lower gravity makes everything so much easier. The BFR design is expandable, possibly to twice the initial payload. Starship can have space for 100 crew. On Mars or on the moon, the design is to launch again. Manu manufacture methane fuel on Mars 
has been developed and maybe used, recall that it is 29 times harder to launch from Mars than from the Moon. Now for SLS. SLS Block 2 is expected to be more powerful than the Saturn V by about 5%. Four RS-25 engines used on the space shuttle burn hydrogen and oxygen. Two solid rocket boosters are also used, also like the shuttle. An upper stage uses an RL-10 engine used by Atlas and Delta rockets. The Orion crew capsule can support six crew for 21 days for NASA's Artemis I mission. The first stage and boosters are expected to be reusable. The design is also expandable, evolving into larger stages, eventually possibly larger than Starship, at least Starship's original initial uh, version. While much of the technology in SLS is or is evolved from existing systems, there have been test failures, as with SpaceX. Artemis II is the first planned crewed mission to perform a flyby to the moon uh, in August of 2023. SpaceX has announced a project involving lunar space tourism also for 2023. While SLS uses existing tech, SpaceX has cost reduction as a long-term goal. SpaceX expects that they have reduced launch costs by a factor of over 300 Elon Musk says that this is over half of the reduction needed in order to sus enable sustainable settlement off of Earth. That's only a factor of 100 to go. The, for the over half bit, think in logarithms. 300 versus 100 is sort of halfway. Um, for the moon race, you might say that who the winner is is still up in the air. And that's term of the month. BFR versus SLS. Back to you, Don. Welcome back, everyone. And thanks, Stephen, for that interesting term of the month. We're here with Anna Sterner from the Michigan Science Center, who's the director of programs. So let's get back into our con conversation. So Anna, what is Echo Live Distance Learning? Good question. Now, Michigan Science Center has been part of the distance learning world since 2017. So we've been doing it for a little while. Um, distance learning, if you're not familiar, um, isn't just pre-recorded. It's actually connecting live over the internet to groups of students that aren't here at the Science Center. Uh, so similar to what you and I are doing right now, Don, I do with students um, across the state of Michigan, but also around the world. Um, it's allowed me to connect with classrooms in other countries, um, in other parts of the world, um, and do fun science experiments that they might normally get to do with us in person, um, even if they're a little bit too far away. ECHO is the Michigan Science Center's brand of distance learning, and part of that is ECHO Live, our newest program. So um, every other week we do a free live science program that's live streamed right in Zoom, but also on YouTube and on uh, the Michigan Science Center's Facebook page. Um, so while I won't be able to see the participants during those programs, so unfortunately I can't see them like I can see you right now, but we still do interactive games and question and answer using the chat on all of those programs. And so we feature exciting science experiments. We blow stuff up, we light stuff on fire. We do some stuff that's not safe to try at home um, because I get to do it safely here at the Michigan Science Center in my distance learning studio and students in classrooms get to get to tune in either from home or from their classroom. Now, I would think that uh, distance learning is even more important now uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, it really is. You know, um, I brought up that originally we use distance learning as a way to connect to classrooms that were too far away for us to reach with things like traveling science or allowing students to take a field trip here to the science center. So get on a bus and head right on down. Um, now, even the students right here in the city of Detroit and even in our surrounding area aren't able to come here on field trips either because of the pandemic. Um, it's not safe to do so just yet. We're definitely hoping that that day will come soon um, and safely, 
but distance learning has become an even bigger part of what I do. It's made me get creative. Um, so all of those programs I talked about earlier, things like our portable planetarium and those presentations and workshops, I've had to get creative and find new ways to teach them virtually to those same students who would normally get to come here in person, but now I reach them online. And so it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Um, and I've gotten to reach kids in a whole new way. So it's been awesome. I understand that you've even been able to reach students way up in far northern Canada. Uh, what was that like? It's fun. It's really awesome. Honestly, um, the farthest classroom that I've reached in Canada is in um, the very top of none of us. And if you don't know where that is, I recommend pulling it up on Google Maps after this and the top of none of it is basically like the Arctic Circle. It's way the most northern part of Canada. And what's interesting about those communities is that they don't have a local science center. They don't have places to take field trips to like students right here in Metro Detroit might. And so I actually teach a lot of programs to those students because their communities, sometimes you can only get there by flying in on a plane or driving in on an ice road. And so I've got to meet people from all over the world, which has been a really exciting part of my job the last few years. Interesting. You mentioned ice roads re reminds me of the program Ice Road Truckers. Mm -hmm. So that conjures up a whole uh, whole list of things of uh, the environment that uh, that they're living in. Uh, any other interesting places that uh, you can think of that you've been with uh, the Echo Live program? Yeah, we teach a lot of programs through a site that's called the uh, it's called CILC, and it's basically like a marketplace for distance learning but they also offer free experiences. So if you want to check out one of these programs that I'm talking about for free, um, head to CILC, They're, they host learning days all the time. And since they host these days for free, students from all over the world can connect in. And I've also connected to students in the Netherlands and Bermuda. Has language been an issue uh, with us providing the, uh, the programs? Not so far, but they do offer programs to students in other countries that do speak other language. I count myself very fortunate um, that English is one of those languages that kids around the world um, sometimes know um, or are learning in school. Um, I, on the other hand, should probably become more fluent in a couple other languages so that I can teach programs other places. <laughs> that would uh, make it much more versatile, that's for sure. Now, on a, on a personal note, what have you learned in doing these distance learning lessons? Ooh, good question. You know, one of the things I was really worried about as we stopped being able to facilitate in-person programming once uh, COVID-19 happened is that kids were gonna lose out on that experience, that it wasn't going to be interactive, that they weren't going to be able to participate the same because they couldn't physically touch something or I couldn't see their face while we're teaching certain types of programs. Um, but I haven't found that to be the case. So something that I've learned about myself and something that I've learned about distance learning is that there are other ways to make programs interactive other than, you know, volunteering or being called on for certain things. Um, if I had a room full of 100 students, like sometimes I used to see in an assembly program, if I were to ask a question, I might be able to call on one or two kids. But when we teach it virtually, like you and I are right now, I can ask a question and every single person who's signing on can answer in the chat or every single one of them can try something at home um, while I'm directing them on camera. And so um, my worries are kind of gone when it comes to that. I know students are still getting to do interactive things at home. I know they're having fun um, and we're both learning new tools. So that's been really awesome. Well, you mentioned interacting. I know on some of the programs, uh, we, we send out supplies to the school in advance so they can have more of that hands-on experience. We do. So if you book one of our ECHO programs for your school, or your library, or even your scout group, if you'd like, um, certain programs that we have, we can actually mail you a kit of supplies. Um, we've done things like making slime or chemistry experiments. Um, we do things with reactions using glow sticks. And so I can actually mail those kits out to students. Um, if I can't, I can also send kids materials lists that they can gather at home. So I've also taught a lot of workshops where I can send you a list of items from around your house, and I'll teach you how to use um, those for doing awesome science experiments, too. It sounds like it's really a well-encompassing program uh, that we've got there at the Science Center. Um, any other interesting uh, experiences you've had with that program? Last year, when uh, our Echo Live program launched, we were really fortunate. I actually got to be featured on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt uh, for one of their episodes of the Kids Edition. 
it was so fun. And it's just another example of how if you take something you do and you take something you love um, and you make it available to the other people around you, that people will recognize you for that. So if you're passionate about something, like I'm passionate about teaching others about science, can lead you really cool places. I never would have expected that I could have been on national news, um, but I'm learning all the time. And it's actually taught me a lot about myself too, that I used to consider myself to be one of those people who was afraid of public speaking. I didn't really like it. And now it's just one of my favorite things to do. Don knows me really well and that I can just talk and talk and talk. It is one of my absolute best skills now. And I've only learned that recently. We've talked about Echo Live. Uh, how can people join in with this program? So if you want to tune into Echo Live, like we said, it is streamed live on the Michigan Science Center's Facebook and YouTube channel. Um, if you do a search for Michigan Science Center on Facebook or YouTube, you can find a list of our upcoming episodes, and you can watch all of our past episodes that live on those websites as well. So we've had over 100 episodes since the program launched last March, and we're still coming out with new ones. And so we upload new ones all the time, and if you happen to be able to catch us live, uh, make sure you shout me out. Make sure you mention that you saw me here on Astronomy for Everyone, and I will make sure I shout you out back um, on camera too. Um, you can also find out more about our ECHO programs on the Michigan Science Center's website. Um, we can put that link up, I'm sure, but it is mi-sci.org. Um, if you do a search for ECHO, you can find out all about those other programs that we're talking about and find ways to watch ECHO Live as well. And folks can also take a look at our brand new website as well that we've updated here just since, uh, just since the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna thank you a ton for being on the show to let folks know what's going on at uh, the Michigan Science Center. Uh, please check the Ford uh, website. Uh, the address is down at the bottom of your screen as always. And coming up next with What's Up in the Night Sky is Steven. Thanks, Don. What's up in the sky for February 2021? We're just going to start with the moons. January essentially ended with a full moon. So the third quarter for February is on the 4th. New moon is on the 11th. First quarter is on the 19th. And the full moon in February is on the 27th. And then we'll look at all of the planets. That's Neptune, Uranus, and Mars. This is shown on February 15th, uh, just a little bit after sunset. Neptune, Uranus, and Mars are all better earlier in the month, but especially Neptune, which sets shortly after the sun does. Mars and Uranus are in Aries and set near midnight. Neptune is in Aquarius, as usual. Now, the reason why there aren't any other planets in the sky for the entire month of February is this. This is the solar system looking sort of down. Now all of the planets orbit the sun counterclockwise in this image. Here on the 15th, Mercury has just gone between the Earth and the sun in inferior conjunction on the 8th. Venus starts out visually close to the sun and it moves a bit faster than the Earth, reaching superior conjunction only on March 26th but it stays very close the entire time. Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto move much slower than the Earth, so they had superior conjunction in January, as we mentioned last month. And that's it for what's up in the night sky for February 2021. Remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain.